Hello and welcome to Games from Folktales, a podcast that mixes historical research and tabletop role-playing settings. I'm your host, Timothy Ferguson, and this is another Cornwall episode. The night after I put the Cornwall Gazetta out as a finished draft, I received a like on the blog that accompanies this podcast from a blog about Cornish folklore and photography. The site's called The Cornish Bird, and I'd recommend it because its writer has walked to many of the places described in the Gazette here, and her photographs are a great aid in visualising the landscape. I've just reread all of her blog entries, and I've made a few notes which will be added to the later iterations of the Cornwall Gazette. In a few posts, the author, whose name I've not picked up because I'm hopeless with names, mentions some things she's found on the shore a jellyfish with a gigantic body that might be started up as a sea monster, a coconut which might act as an arcane connection to the shore from which it travelled, a polished blob of sea glass which might be the link to a lost magician's laboratory or to lioness, given the rarity of glass in the 12th century. The same post mentions the wreck of the Brig Victoria, which was laden with wine. The locals swarmed the wreck to steal the cargo until the riot act was read to them, that's a story seed, perhaps with grogs and villagers, pushed on by a merry devil, or two, in competition. Hereth is the name she gives to the Cornish sense of place, the yearning for home. That could be a personality trait, and it could be coupled with the odd Cornish power of sending your ghost to pass on a final message. Maybe you can only send it home. There may be a minimum score to enable you to send your ghost. It may also define covenant loyalty, for the servants around the Magi. There's a hedge, a stone wall, made by a giant from Leren to Lou. I did read about it, but didn't include it in the Gazette here because I couldn't find a story hook. The hook is this. This hedge marks the side of the oldest road in Cornwall. It was perhaps a Roman road, although it doesn't have their usual straight character, and it must have been a ferry trod that it ends so close to one of the suggested Covenant sites, Lou, and at the other end, is so close to Lostwithal and the old throne of the King of Cornwall at Restormall Castle, makes it useful for player characters who can travel the Twilight Roads. Leren is also a likely site for a Bajorna Covenant. It's the river from the Wind in the Willows. While I was at university, I read William Hornwell's sequels, and often thought that the four main characters could be magi in an idyllic little regio. The author notes that the Cornish word for a sea giant, like a sea serpent, is Morgwa. I'm sure this will come in handy as a monster name or as a species. I've been trying to work up an Irish whale eater as a Bajorna elder for a while, and this may give her a name. She notes that the hair of Cornish mermaids can be exceptionally long, eight or ten feet in one example. Visors, bit of colour, enchantable in fabric crafts. There are five Roman milestones in Cornwall. I've not mapped them, but they may be valuable, because some players suggest the Roman road network is vital to House Macquarie's magic and their work. The Mystery Lady of Crantock is a fine piece of art that postdates the game period, but a similar thing could be found in any mine or cave that had given rest to an inspired mortal. St Kenya's well and chair have been mentioned in the blog, but the photographs may inspire detail for your stories. Lanavet is the centre of Cornwall. There's even a carved cross there to mark the spot. Why would you need to put a carved cross, and so a dominion aura, on the exact centre of Cornwall? Langarrow is described, but in the most part it's from the same sources that I used in the Gazette here. That being said, one of the illustrations on the page is a book called Amarel of Lioness by Walter Besant. It doesn't seem relevant to the game, but in searching for its plot, I did find a paper called The Lost Lands of Lioness, telling stories of Cornwall and the Isle of Scilly by Maria Mitchell, which I've not yet gone through, but does need a deeper look. I'd note it comes from a journal called Shima, which is about maritime cultures, which I've not heard of before, so I have to hunt that up too. There's a note about how china clay is abundantly found in Cornwall. It's not used in the 12th century, but it might be that the player characters discover its use I'd like to flag that some people, well, the QI elves, suggested that fine Chinese porcelain slowed down their technological development, indeed, most of the continent of Asia's technological development, because Europe instead went for glass, and through glass to spectacles and optics. The Chinese knew about glass, but they liked porcelain more. The player characters have a chance to seriously alter the course of history 
if they make china clay porcelain popular, particularly because magi can probably make it easily enough once they discover it to be granite that's decayed. You could limit it by making it the ashes of dead earth elementals or something like that, I suppose. The author mentions a pre-Roman burial in a mine, that's a plot hook, ghosts, the restless dead, and so on. The discovery of Neptune is mentioned in the real world that happened in 1846, but given that we have a bunch of missing astrologers and Neptune is the lord of things that flow, might they have seen it earlier? Might they have, more frighteningly, caused it to be formed? On a related issue, I'd not heard of the Nebra sky disk before, and it seems to be made with Cornish gold. It seems a useful thing to add to the game, even if in the real world it was only discovered in 1999. I like that some of the added gold comes from the Carpathian Mountains, where all kinds of spookiness occur. The Montol Festival in Penzance is their midwinter festival, so it would be happening when the Aegeus is raised. I'm not sure it goes back to period. In a later post on Venton Bellabel, the Well of the Little People, the author notes the Montol and the Well have a shared custom of using toys to represent spirits, in the latter case with people baptising dolls. The Randigan rhymes contain a little glossary of Cornish words, which I might lift to give Grogs a touch of local speech, to differentiate them from outsiders. I also need to check the rhymes for useful folklore. Figgy Dowdier, which mentioned many times in the Gazette, has a well named for her. Her name gets jostled about a bit, so Figgy can become her surname, and sometimes she's Maggie or Margaret. Her name is sometimes given as Dor. Now this means Marjorie Dor is one of her names, and the author links that to the nursery rhyme, Seesaw Marjorie Dor, Johnny shall have a new master. Well, she says Jackie, and the internet tells me that I was raised with an odd variant. I'd note a Jackie door is a bird, using the odd custom of adding human names to species names, much as Maggie Pye's bird or Robin Redbreast is a bird. I'd also flag that Opie and Opie give an earlier version as Seesaw Madri door, sold her bed and lay on the straw, sold her bed and lay on the hay, and Pixie came and carried her away, for wasn't she a dirty slut to sell her bed and lie in the dirt? Slut, in this case, has no sexual connotation. In period, it means a dishevelled person. It tends to be used for servants. The author of the Cornish bird suggests she was an early saint or goddess. The author has heaps of posts about fuggos. One of them has a pixie hall. She also has photographs of the hooting cairn where demons wrestle. So if you found the Gazette useful and you'd like excellent photographs of some of the places, head on out to the Cornish bird Links in the blog that accompanies this podcast. Your saga may vary.